Uh, welcome to the uh, WaveX webinar that's focused on irrigation, uh, direct root zone irrigation and sensors is the short, short version. I'm Melissa Hansen, the research program director for the Washington State Wine Commission, and Dr. Pete Jacoby, who's a uh, soil ecologist for Washington State University, uh, is our guest speaker today. The Washington wine industry has funded uh, and supported some of Pete's uh, research um, and irrigation work in the last 10 years. And so he's uh, summarizing some of what he's been doing in the last three or four years today. I have just a couple housekeeping uh, things. There we go, uh, to remind you uh, to be sure to ask questions, put them in the Q&A and at the end, we'll have plenty of time and I will uh, get them addressed to Pete so he can uh, respond. And we are recording this and a link will be mailed, emailed to everybody who registered. So if uh, you know somebody who didn't attend, uh, they will automatically get it. And then eventually we will have them up on the Wine Commission's website. Uh, and just a plug for next month's WaveX webinar, um, April 20th, uh, Nematode Management to Fumigate or Not, Dr. Michelle Moyer from WSU is summarizing a part of uh, her rootstock work on nematodes. <clears throat> And uh, so uh, to register for that, you can go to the Wine Commission's uh, website and hit the research wave button. So with that, I want to just uh, thank Washington State University and the Washington Wine Commission. This uh, wave stands for Washington Advancements in Viticulture and Enology. And these are our research seminars and then WaveX, uh, we've uh, branded those as really condensed one hour uh, webinars, so a condensed focus. So this is a, a pro program that's sponsored both by WSU and the Wine Commission. And uh, it's our effort to help push research results to the industry that's helping to fund them. So with that, I um, will now have Pete pull up your slides. And I'm going to mute. OK, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. And as uh, Melissa said, I go over some of the accomplishments that have been uh, seen in the last uh, roughly uh, eight years. and. Um, so we'll get started here and okay pete, uh, but, we don't pete we don't have your slides up yet oh okay so okay so i'm sharing and let's see that share Go to the share screen and click on the PowerPoint. Yeah. I have the share. And the PowerPoint is on somewhere else. We'll get it. Okay, now it's coming. Now just uh, put it in the screen mode and we'll be ready. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Very good. I'm going to uh, hide this little thing. All right. Uh, again, pleasure to be here. So we'll get started. So there's a couple of terms here in the title. Uh, use of DRZ subsurface irrigation and sensor-based irrigation scheduling for greater vineyard water productivity. So first of all, what is DRZ subsurface irrigation? 
we'll define that. Then we'll go directly then to what is greater vineyard water product, uh, productivity. And later in the presentation, we'll get into this uh, area right here about sensor-based scheduling. So we'll first define direct root zone subsurface irrigation. It is a form of subsurface irrigation that uh, is uh, accomplished by delivering the water through a PVC uh, vertical tube that's placed to a certain depth. When we first started the project here on Red Mountain uh, in, in the uh, uh, vineyard that you, you see right, right here, uh, and, and this is uh, part of Kiona's uh, block two. It's part of the heart of the hill vineyard. It's uh, at the time we uh, started the research, it was a 12, uh, a eight year old planting of Cabernet Sauvignon clone two. Um, and so we, we came in and we put these uh, tubes in uh, on about uh, 900 vines. Uh, here we see uh, some other devices. These are solar panel uh, powered uh, boxes that transmit data from our sensors back to a cloud server in Walla Walla. So this is where uh, we got started. And the reason that we use this system to deliver subsurface irrigation was largely a result of me working with an advisory committee of four growers at that time. And when I mentioned subsurface irrigation, they explained to me that uh, they, they knew or had experienced themselves uh, problems with uh, buried lines to deliver this from either soil clogging or chewing by what is called a sage rat. Uh, so this was an attempt to try to get past that problem and still uh, experience the efficiencies and demonstrate those of using subsurface irrigation. So then what is crop water productivity? It's largely your uh, yield per acre, in this case, grapes uh, per irrigation amount used, or you can say amount of fruit per amount of water applied. That's pretty much crop water productivity. So if we look at an example of this, we're looking at some 2015 data uh, where we're delivering commercially by surface drip uh, 1.35 acre feet of water. Uh, we didn't know where to start on trying to get efficiency, so we dropped uh, the amount that we were applying by subsurface to 60% of this figure, 30, and stretching it really far down to 15. So we just cut it in half all the way down. Here is the water uh, per vine uh, that was used. And then um, here is the grape production that was harvested in the fall. So we see a slight uh, decline from uh, the 30% level and the 15% uh, level in total productivity. But when uh, the crop product production is divided by the water use, then you can see what uh, the actual water crop water production was. So uh, we increase it as we uh, de decrease water. And uh, you can see the uh, uh, factors here. Another way to express it is relative crop water efficiency. So if we give the commercial rate here a one, uh, then we increase it by half uh, here to a 1.5, 2.5, and 4.7. Uh, that's just an indicator of what you're getting for the amount of water you're, you're putting on. So when we look at yield uh, from the DRZ uh, applications only, uh, we applied these at three rates. Uh, again, we, we talk about it here in terms of uh, our highest rate being 100%, then the next rate 50, and then 25. But you see that uh, for the different depths here shown in color, like this is the one foot, two foot, and three foot, that's down to the point we're dropping the water out of that tube, releasing it. Um, so we see... Uh, what we can expect here in grape yield. And we um, 
got more grape yield uh, here by putting it down deeper than this was the three foot level right here where my era is, uh, two feet and one. And we sort of settled on two foot. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So this is in 2015. This was the hottest and driest rec uh, year on record at that time. Uh, it was a really, really hot year. And so it's a great year, quite honestly, to test this principle. 2016 was a little more what we'd call normal. Uh, we didn't see much difference here between any of the depths in this year. Uh, so we, again, just settled on the uh, uh, the two-foot level. Uh, we do see a drop, of course, in the amount of water. So that's, that's where what was really affecting grape uh, yield was the, the amount of water. What about grape quality? So we collected uh, samples of the grapes that were harvested under each treatment, the surface drip uh, at 100%, subsurface drip at 60, 30, and 15. We sent these to um, a lab in Walla Walla um, and uh, got these figures back. So we didn't use all of the factors that they measured, but when we look at pH acidity, uh, we saw uh, actually a movement toward uh, neutral, uh, which is seven, as we uh, uh, experience more or, or actually less water being applied. In terms of bricks, uh, we saw a in general increase in bricks, and this does follow a number of published works uh, that have been uh, produced, uh, showing that with more stress, if you will, uh, which we're applying here by uh, putting on less water. Uh, we're increasing uh, the bricks of the sugar content. Tannins, um, also seeing uh, an increase as we uh, decrease the amount of water. And anthocyanins went uh, up quite a bit as a result of, and, and this so uh, results uh, in a stress factor on the vine when you're putting uh, less water back on than it's typically losing through uh, ET or evapotranspiration. Here's just another way of graphing it. Uh, the titratable acidity um, uh, is the recidity's, uh, uh, it's taking more acid to titrate it uh, here and less as we go toward neutral pH here, anthocyanins, bricks, and tannins. So the summary from the first uh, three years that we did this, starting in 2015, we found that overall uh, the direct root zone subsurface irrigation could save at least 35% of water compared to the commercial rates being applied by surface drip. We found as irrigation rates were reduced, the grape yields were slightly reduced while grape quality was improved, both in pH, TA, uh, titratable acidity, tannins, and bricks. We saw no differences uh, in, really in overall yield or quality among the depths, whether we put the water or released it uh, in uh, DRZ at one, two, or three feet of water release and only in amount of water applied. So the two foot depth was used in our subsequent research and we published this work in 2019. A duplicate study uh, was performed on Chardonnay wine grapes. They were younger vines. They were in three leaf uh, stage and we did experience some frost damage in 2015 uh, in one spot. Um, and so we didn't really uh, start this research until 2016. And this is near Prosser, west of Prosser and it's a Hogue Ranches block 112. We found uh, the summary here uh, that DRZ subsurface irrigation, again, improved crop water productivity by 23 to almost 35% over surface drip. It increased uh, bricks by 9% and yan uh, by 24.4. Uh, DRZ reduced irrigation amount by 16 to 23 without any yield reduction on these uh, younger Chardonnay grapes. And uh, in the upper 
one thing that we found that was quite interesting uh, was that we reduced the roots in the upper uh, two feet of the soil profile compared to uh, surface drip. So uh, this study was just uh, published uh, in 2000. Uh, 23 by my PhD student uh, and some of his colleagues are now in China. How did we do uh, this root uh, evaluation? We used a root imaging device that's uh, produced in Camas, Washington. It's called a mini Rhizotron. It basically you put a clear acetate tube down that's sealed on the bottom. Uh, these were uh, seven foot tubes uh, into that we placed um, this uh, camera. So uh, this is a camera that uh, takes about an eight inch uh, photograph. And uh, when it's activated by a laptop, such as my student here is doing, um, then that uh, camera rotates 360 degrees and it's taking a picture through the clear acetate tube uh, at the root contacts on the outside. So we get a, uh, a measure of both root qu uh, quantity uh, as well as overall uh, root length in that. And so that's what he's uh, doing here. And we only looked at the first two uh, feet initially because it takes a lot of time to do this. And he was uh, accomplishing his PhD dissertation at that time, but he later went back and looked at it uh, to a much deeper depth. So here we see the impact of DRZ on root abundance in the upper soil profile. So the, the uh, open uh, column here is surface drip and the shaded one is DRZ. So here at the flowering to fruit set stage uh, of, of the growing season, uh, we didn't see a whole lot of difference uh, in those measures, we saw a little bit more in the second year, 2018, uh, where there were fewer roots from the DRZ, except for this one, uh, the low rate. Uh, as we go in later into each season, the uh, variation through harvest, um, in 2017, we started to see some significant differences uh, in terms of the number of roots, except again in the lowest uh, treatment. Um, probably the water just was not getting down to the same amount uh, as was in this uh, these two higher rates, this 60 and 30 percent rate. Uh, again, uh, that was duplicated in 2018. And uh, again, we saw pretty much the same results that most of our difference is occurring right up in the uh, uh, the high and the moderate uh, rates. So that was in the upper two feet. When we looked at root numbers over in this chart uh, and uh, root length over here, that data is pretty much again shown. So the black dot lines as seen right here is the DRZ and the open dot lines are the surface drip. So here again, we see um, that uh, the soil, as the soil depth is going down to about five and a half feet here, we're seeing most of our difference in the upper profile where we have a lot more um, uh, root um, uh, mass uh, in this upper uh, profile. And we're reducing the amount uh, that's uh, actually being done because we're applying the water deeper uh, down in the soil profile. When we look at root lengths, we're seeing a similar thing. And what's uh, interesting here is we start going down uh, in the uh, soil depth. Uh, we see uh, a real response of, of more root mass being developed at the deeper depths, less in the top. So that's, uh, the roots are, are changing their architecture, the vines are putting more uh, root uh, length and root mass down deeper uh, below two feet where we're releasing the water, uh, which is probably a measure of some type of resilience uh, to drought. Uh, so this is what we're hypothesizing in our current research is that by 
changing the depth of the large amount of root mass uh, that the vines can withstand these hotter temperatures. And for instance, 2022 had about a, a 10 degree Fahrenheit. It was uh, that much hotter than was 2021. We had those really hot days in August and uh, part of July, and it made an overall uh, difference. Uh, so we're, we're seeing that. Uh, now, uh, we looked at other things. Uh, I'm not going to go much into this, but we also looked at CO2 uh, assimilation, which is taking carbon out of the air. And as we have the higher rates uh, are doing it more, there's more water being applied here. Uh, we're taking more out. Uh, stomatal conductance and transpiration rate are two other measures. We were just looking at a vine physiological activity. And we can summarize those findings that the uh, vines that were irrigated by the uh, direct root zone had higher photosynthetic car carbon assimilation. In other words, uh, they're taking more carbon out. Uh, they're building most of it down into that lower root zone. Um, DRZ irrigated vines also shifted the root development deeper into the profile. And DRZ could also mitigate, we believe, vine stress under global warming and enhance vine resilience to drought events in semi-arid regions. We published this work in 2020. It was picked up and republished in a special publication about how grapevines are being impacted by warmer uh, growing conditions around the globe by a group of uh, international uh, authors here, so our paper was republished in that. How did we assess vine water stress? Uh, the gold standard for this is what is called the pressure bomb. So um, basically, uh, this is a nurse tank of uh, compressed nitrogen. This is the main tank we're uh, refilling periodically. Uh, it puts uh, nitrogen under pressure into this chamber. And uh, prior to applying that pressure, we take a leaf, we cut it off at the petiole. Uh, the leaf is down into the chamber and the uh, about half an inch of the, the uh, leaf stem or petiole is sticking out here and it's been cut with a razor blade. So we increase uh, wind, uh, the uh, pressure inside this chamber and it and as we increase it this dial starts increasing and uh, at the time that water uh, emerges out of the cut stem you turn off your uh, uh, the amount of nitrogen you're putting in you take your reading and that is a measure of how uh, much uh, the, the pressure the uh, vine is actually exerting uh, on, on the um, leaf and uh, shutting the st stomates down to avoid loss of water. So seasonal patterns uh, were followed in two, two years here. So again, the open ones are surface drip. The uh, darker ones are, um, in terms of stress, are the DRZ. So as we start off here at, at fruit set, uh, pre-verasian, uh, post-verasian, and near harvest, when we took these measurements, we start seeing a pattern emerge where there is actually more stress. So this is a negative value, uh, uh, that's stress. So the surface drip is starting to uh, see a lot more stress. Uh, it's got all of its roots in the top part. And when they run out of water, uh, they're shutting down. Uh, and that's why we had more carbon assimilation um, going on uh, in the DRZ. And so uh, it becomes significantly different at stages down here. So if you don't have an A behind the things, that's significantly different. Here, it's uh, both of these are significantly different. So again, in uh, 2018, not much difference here at fruit set. pre verasian we start seeing the pattern develop again and more stress uh, being applied. We also wanted to uh, take in um, 
the uh, values of uh, the, sorry, got a little interference here. Um, taking those uh, pressure bomb readings across a, a larger area, say a whole vineyard block, takes a lot of time and effort and you're out there typically uh, at the hottest part of the day or at least noon. Uh, so these are called midday pressure readings and it's quite unpleasant on some of these days to be out there doing that. Uh, yet we wanted to know, is there a, a better way that will give you the same kind of data? So we worked with Lav Coat and his group uh, using a drone and a multispectral camera uh, to take images like this. And then they did their calculations uh, of this. And uh, a number of students worked on this through last year even. And we have basically seen these kind of physiological responses of the vines to the subsurface drip. So we know that DRZ watered vines had significantly higher rates of net CO2 assimilation. These are just measures of activity, lower water stress uh, than vines receiving the same level of irrigation by uh, surface drip. Um, DRZ produced both number and, and uh, total root length in the upper two feet uh, of the soil profile, it reduced that, producing more roots and lower so pro uh, soil profile, indicating change in root architecture and potential drought stress resistance. And then remote sensing demonstrated the potential to monitor vine stress uh, fairly accurately. So that was good news. And we published that work again in Frontiers of Plant Science, which is an international journal out of uh, Switzerland. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the movement towards sensor-based irrigation scheduling. And so that's the use of these soil water sensors that are placed at uh, depth and the data is continuously recorded. It's actually transmitted every 15 minutes back to Walla Walla to a cloud server. Uh, so we're getting data off of this continuously for each treatment. So we had uh, 10 of these, uh, these uh, sensors. I'll tell you a little bit more about them. They're made in Australia uh, under a company called Syntec Technologies, and they're used for agriculture and have been for some time uh, over there. A little bit about how they work. Uh, there's a, a plastic... Uh, device that on which you place these sensors and you can adjust these where they are. This is all of the uh, electronics that uh, takes that that data, uh, condenses it, uh, transforms it, and puts it into data storage until it's transmitted. And these represent water molecules out in here. So electronic uh, conductance has pretty much replaced uh, the previous uh, form of measuring water down in the soil repeatedly at one spot through neutron attenuation, which operates the same way, except you have a nuclear device here uh, emitting uh, electrons or neutrons, which go out and collide with a hydrogen particle and bounce back, and then they're recorded how many. So the more counts you get, the more water you you have in the same way with this electrical system. So this allows you to look uh, at the same site over and over again, or continuously record it, rather than with a neutron probe, you had to take it out there. You can't leave it in the field uh, because it's a nuclear uh, source. Uh, so you just get point in time measurements, whereas here you can record the actual water that's in the profile down to the depth that you're interested in. And you get some measure of uh, root zone activity by how much water is being taken out at uh, what time. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, what's come along in the last five years is something called auto water, which is automated irrigation scheduling. So you you have your probes located in typical places within your blocks. Uh, the data is being taken out. It's transmitted back to a source. It's calculated. Uh, 
and then according to what the grower uh, wishes to to put on for water and how much stress he wants to put on the vine, you calculate that, uh, set it, and these uh, pressure sensors, flow meters, and electronic pumps are activated automatically rather than have uh, someone have to go around and turn the water on and off on these. They can uh, be turned on and off uh, automatically. So we have sort of an overarching objective here, and that is to evaluate the combined use of two types of soil water sensors uh, for uh, using improved irrigation scheduling. Uh, we also uh, trying to employ and evaluate the potential use of DRZ subsurface irrigation to improve crop water use efficiency and productivity. And we wanna know what is the uh, impact on the grape yield and quality under reduced uh, subsurface irrigation compared to subsurface uh, drip. So the idea here is to try to come up with a level of stress that you want to put on the vine and maintain it rather than have these uh, up and down measures of sort of feast and famine that go on and it equates back to how much stress and when you're getting it during the season. So with surface drip and sub, uh, surface drip here, uh, we put the e emitter, uh, which is dripping water on the soil surface right at the sensor. And we did the same thing. We put a subsurface drip emitter down Sorry about that. Right by uh, a, another sensor. And so we're comparing these under four different levels of watering uh, in the Kiona Vineyard. So here we're seeing um, sensor, uh, uh, different types of uh, these Syntex sensors. So this is the first ones we had, and they're about $3,000 a piece. They're really more suited for research than the uh, the newer farm is called a drill and drop, and it's a tapered tube that you use a tapered drill, and then you actually pound it with a rubber mallet. Once you've got it down so far, you tap, tap it on in, and it's uh, got these internal uh, things. You can either read them down to 24 or 36 inches, about ever four inches along this, whereas these can be adjusted at, at times. So these are good research tools. And we're using both. This is something we've also added is a soil tensiometer. Meter group here in Pullman has developed one called the Terrace 21 Gen 2. And um, it uh, is placed into the soil. It has to be in constant contact with the soil. So putting these in is a careful skill. Uh, to get good data, uh, you need to put them in correctly. So there's a certain amount of schooling that goes on how to do this. this they have uh, the opportunity to plug in to a, a data uh, storage module or uh, you can, uh, in our case, we just uh, have them produce for us with a three wire pigtail that we can put into our existing uh, sensors uh, that are powered by uh, the larger uh, solar panels uh, that we have in the field. but. Uh, if uh, having those in the field would be um, uh, a problem, you know, for a commercial vineyard, um, you could uh, go to a smaller farm. So here's basically this lower line is showing uh, the data from this sensor, which was put in about 14 inches, uh, 13, 14 inches, I guess, in uh, down here. Um, so we're getting the sensor data here. This is an irrigation event. These are the different uh, depths where we're measuring the water uh, down to 24 inches here. And then we're, we're seeing uh, this is showing how much of this water is actually available uh, to the plant. So it's not being held in high tension uh, by the soil. So as we uh, put a lot of water, here's two events here. Uh, back to back and another one following it pretty close order, uh, we see a big increase in availability of the water. So we can monitor, uh, this is just another way to monitor where possible stress may be occurring because how much water is actually available to the, uh, the vine 
at a particular depth. So we uh, have those uh, in a research, uh, two research sites. Uh, we put three of those uh, sensors down uh, to measure soil availability at three different depths. Um, I wanted to show you some data that uh, we're looking at uh, DRZ subsurface at six at the 60% rate uh, in two different years. Uh, we're comparing also the year 2021 and 2022. Uh, so we can uh, get uh, average soil. Uh, this is air temperature, the average uh, during 2021. And I mentioned earlier, here's the average air temperature in 2022. And uh, overall, uh, we had an average maximum temperature of 90.2 in 2021. And we had uh, 97 uh, here in uh, 2022, so quite a bit hotter. Here's our seasonal pattern of irrigation events. Every four days is what our commercial uh, cooperator uses uh, to maintain uh, his uh, level of uh, desired uh, deficit irrigation. And this, this comes uh, with almost 50 years experience doing this. So uh, he's got it down pretty well on, on this particular site. And um, we're looking here at uh, soil moisture at, uh, with a DRZ uh, treatment at, at 60, like up here. And we see that for the two years. Now you see some difference here in the pattern uh, that we had, same amount of water being applied, uh, same frequency, uh, except here later in the season, uh, he's starting to stretch them out because the uh, vine uh, probably harvest is right in this, this area here. Here's the fall fertigation taking place here. We also see the overall increase in water. Uh, so there's a drop after each irrigation event by a certain amount, uh, much greater variation and drop on the same scale here during the, uh, this 2022. So when you're looking at stress, we had a lot more stress going on uh, in 2022 compared to uh, 2021. So this, uh, is a, a chart showing surface drip at a 60% rate. Uh, here we see the irrigation patterns going on. This is in September. Um, and we see up here, this sort of flattening on the top. That means that you have uh, saturated the soil surface at that uh, seven inch depth. So the, each color represents a different depth. This shows the overall accumulation of the water in the profile. And interestingly, you see that not much water uh, content changes down at the lower part of the soil profile. And you actually get a, a slight increase in the amount of, of uh, soil water content up in, in this uh, range here. And most of the activity here uh, with this uh, surface drip is taking place in the top three levels, so down to about 22 inches. We can measure this uh, from the data that we're uh, getting back out of the cloud server uh, with a cursor. So we can go up here to the uh, point that we reach the maximum uh, soil water content here uh, uh, during the irrigation period and read what those values are at each level. Um, and then we uh, do that again at the point right before uh, the next irrigation event, which we have the lowest amount, and we get some values here. And by doing uh, some simple mathematics, we can figure out how much water was actually used uh, between those two events. So this is showing that soil water distribution and use under surface drip and uh, over on this chart. Uh, direct root zone over here, so subsurface here, and this is just during the month of, of August. So we took all readings uh, in the month of August of 2021 at this reduced rate 
Uh, the green is uh, the measurement taken on the day of the irrigation event. The blue bar is uh, the lowest point right before we irrigate again. And we see uh, up here the water use. So on surface drip, as we would expect, most of the water is being used right in the top part. And this accounts for both transpiration by the vine and evaporation from soil loss and capillary action that pulls more of the water out just because the water is closer to the soil surface. Not much activity down here at all below 30 inches. Uh, with subsurface irrigation, uh, we're seeing a little bit of difference here in, in 2021 uh, where we have water use, even though it's being uh, delivered down at uh, 24 inches, we're still getting capillary action and actually movement of the water or what is called hydraulic redistribution. So the roots uh, pick up the water from depth and they'll redistribute it actually into the uh, soil water. And so UC Davis uh, had done some work on this. And in my mind, it sort of helps explain why partial root zone irrigation may not give you quite the results you want when you're just moving it from one side of the vine to the other between events is because the vine is outsmarting uh, the grower in this case, and uh, it's moving water where water is less. And this has been pretty much borne out with some other research. So over here in direct root zone, we're seeing that the uh, use period goes down quite a bit deeper in terms of water use, at least in this year. So what did it look like in 2022? Very quickly, same pattern pretty much here on the 60% surface drip, same rate here in, in subsurface. We're seeing a little different pattern taking place here that uh, actually more water is being used at, at a lower depth there. So as those hot temperatures were taking their toll, uh, the vine was able to extract more water uh, from these deeper depths when it really needed it. So if we just compare uh, two treatments, DRZ 60% uh, uh, here between the two years, we can see these patterns again. I pretty much uh, described that. And then if we uh, wanted to look at uh, the two uh, different systems under surface strip or direct root zone, we see a different pattern of water use uh, over here in 2022. Uh, and so that uh, pretty much tells the story that uh, there's the plant, the vine is using more water. It's getting what it needs to maintain itself and yet it's still not getting what it's losing. So we're maintaining what we believe is about a 60% uh, level of uh, deficit irrigation. These are uh, just measures real quick of, of the soil water content, uh, what is available to the plant uh, here at three different depths. So uh, here we had a 10 inch, 18 inch and uh, 26 inch depth where we place these uh, tensiometers and we're just measuring how much. And this is um, uh, data that's taken uh, in September, so we're not seeing real extremes here, but uh, we have seen uh, this go down to, uh, whereas this is uh, at the high point about uh, minus nine, minus 10, and minus six, we can go minus 600 uh, in the heat of the summer down at these upper levels and less at the lower level. So here shows just a slight drop here like uh, 57 at the top, uh, 18 inches uh, is uh, 44 and then uh, another 58 down here on the, on the lower level. So that pretty much tells you what uh, we have done, what we are doing and uh, I'd be very open now to uh, take questions and um, we'll get out of this. Um, and go go back um, here. I'm gonna yeah. release my my shared screen back to you, Melissa. Okay. If... Um, so, Pete, uh, one question in the Q and A: um, 
seems like rocky soil sites would be a problem for placing the monitoring probes and the irrigation tubing. So can you maybe talk about, you know, the, the physical part of putting these tubes in and how hard is it um, uh, and give it, give it a shot that way? Well, we've got, um, that's a really good question. And um, um, I'm going to stop this screen share right here. Yeah, um, yeah. So we actually uh, put a site in at Milton Freewater in the Rocks District. So we've got, I've had some real experience with this. Um, so yes, uh, rocks uh, present uh, a definite barrier uh, to putting these uh, these uh, type of probes in. Um, we have we had to try numerous times just to drill down and find uh, a place where we could get the the probe in. But uh, we also found that within any vineyard, even down in the rocks that there are differences about how much, how many rocks or how much topsoil is in some of that site. So um, we did find some uh, difference that uh, we didn't expect. It didn't, from the surface, it looked all alike, but um, we did, uh, we're, did find a little bit easier place to put uh, those in, but uh, rocks present a problem. Uh, even up on Red Mountain though, there is a, uh, what is often called a plow pan, uh, but this is uh, precipitated calcium carbide or uh, calcium carbonate uh, that uh, through uh, years and years of uh, irrigation, uh, 40 or 50 years in some sites, uh, you get a uh, hard pan that develops at, that is ever bit uh, as tough to get through um, as, as actual rock. And uh, yet vines during these uh, wet periods seem to get a few roots down, but they're pretty spindly. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, both of those factors uh, get that, but we use a hydraulic drill, uh, but trying to take soil samples this year during that hot summer, um, we were actually lifting one uh, side of the tractor, the wheel off the ground, uh, trying to push down a hydraulic probe to take a soil sample. Um, uh, that's really hard. And so it was at about 30 inches. And that's about where we see in those charts that we're not getting much water movement below that, that depth. So it tells you a lot what you have to work with in your particular vineyard and the type of soils you're working with, yeah. which is a good thing to know because uh, if you just sort of look at it out there uh, without knowing what's under it, uh, you've got a whole different world below the soil. So another question, um, are there maintenance advantages to DRZ? You know, less damage to the tubes? Maybe you can touch on longevity and there, maintenance. There definitely are. Um, uh, there is, uh, if you're using uh, certain types of um, mechanized means uh, to uh, use one of these string type uh, weed control things that you pull along, it'll destroy the, the system. Um, uh, we have a commercial vineyard down in the gorge uh, that's using this system. And uh, it was a young vineyard. So they put the tube right near the vine in the same hole as they put the uh, plant in. And uh, I'm told they're working quite well. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, distance to put them from when we first started, made a lot of mistakes and you learn from your mistakes. So one thing we found is that uh, you can have problems uh, in maintenance by being overzealous and pushing the tube into the soil and you plug the bottom of the tube. So we fixed that. Uh, we have a cover on there that prevents uh, uh, roots and uh, from coming up into it and from soil getting plugged into it. Uh, so um, the water flows readily through it. Uh, so it'll release the water without plugging the tube. And that's a big advantage. Uh, but I was told by my advisory committee, expect uh, root intrusion and we got it. And um, the other thing is just uh, tractor rash, if you will. Uh, 
sometimes, uh, you know, uh, trying to get one job done, you create another. And uh, we have pulled the feeder tubes out uh, uh, sometimes. At worst, you get um, sort of a spray uh, concentration there, but uh, depends on what part of the tube comes off, comes off near the emitter, uh, which is directly in the feeder line, then you could, uh, you could have a lot of water where you don't want it. If it just pulls it out of the tube, it's, it's still drip irrigation. So it's just dripping on the surface rather than through the tube. So that can be quickly uh, fixed. We've eliminated most of the problems uh, in that system. Um, I don't produce uh, it uh, commercially. I, I got a grant from my university to look into developing a commercialized business. I decided I'm not a businessman to begin with. I did this out of interest to see if it works and I don't wanna be in the business of selling. So what I've uh, focused on right now is a uh, cooperative experiment where we have growers in Arizona, California, Oregon, had one in Kansas, um, and then some in Washington state that we work with. And I've actually provided them the equipment and they have been kind enough to make a donation into a uh, 401, uh, 40, uh, I think it's a 401c3. Um, so it allows me to get my work done, to travel to these locations, to look at the results that they're getting. And it also tells me that certain individuals are early adopters in new, new things that come along. They're willing to take some risk and I take risk with them, but we learn in the process because we're gaining experience by having the system working in different climatic zones, um, in different soils under different growing conditions. So um, we're using this to our advantage to, to try to win more federal grants because we're serving a larger area with something. And in certain areas uh, of that distribution in the American West, water's a lot harder to get uh, or, and even buy. Uh, so trying to make the most of your water is one advantage. I'm not trying to I sound like a salesman now, but I'm yeah. uh, there. There is a commercial firm out there that has produced something similar to what we have, but they have big holes in them. Uh, so I think root intrusion is going to be a problem. The other factor, it cost me about two dollars paying student labor because we produce everything with student labor, uh, provides job opportunities to our students. Uh, and I produce those for about two dollars. Uh, the commercial variety that uh, is being marketed, uh, they're trying to sell them for 10 to $15 a piece. That's a lot of money. Um, even at $2, it's something. But uh, we've had good luck uh, working with the cooperators we have, and we, uh, we've had minimal damage um, with our current cooperators. So there was just one more comment in the Q&A, just that the rock profile uh, could be influenced by subsoil ripping to break up that caliche prior to planting your vineyard. Um, yeah. How long it would last, I don't know. Um, you know, but yes, you, you could do that. Uh, what we tried to look at uh, was, uh, particularly with the growers uh, in several of those states, uh, is put the system in when you're planting your, your new part of your vineyard. Uh, and minimize the cost of putting it in. And then as you develop those uh, young plants, you're sort of training them for what you want them to be. Uh, so it's not necessary to have the roots spreading all over. They will go for where the water is. Um, but if you're trying to use subsurface irrigation, you can probably train that plant and then control it more effectively for achieving the level and the effect of deficit irrigation that you want to imply. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, we're learning as we go. We're still, uh, it's not fun uh, uh, encountering a rock when you're almost to the depth that you need <laughs> and then have to put in another one. But that's the way it is. Uh, so, so I have uh, no other questions. Um, All right. So well, let me say let me say this, Melissa. If uh, if people do have a question, or if they want copies of any of these publications that I talked about, 
uh, to look at in more depth and detail. I'd be happy to provide those. All they have to do is just contact me. It's uh, my last name, Jacoby, in small letters at wsu.edu. Um, and uh, I'd be happy and always wel uh, welcome the opportunity to visit with growers. I learn something every time. Uh, and uh, hopefully I can answer questions. And if they want to try this, I'm more than happy to uh, willing to cooperate you know, and collaborate with them. Great. So thank you, Pete. This will wrap up uh, this month's WaveX. Um, and I remind you, if you're interested in uh, some very interesting results that Michelle Moyer has found regarding fumigation and uh, efficacy on specific nematodes, uh, register for next month's WaveX. Uh, as I mentioned, we did record this, so everybody who registered will get the recording link and we will um, make it available to the industry. So thank you and we will sign off. Thank you for the opportunity, Melissa. Okay, bye-bye.